Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the uh, Romans Education Part 6, and this is Session 1. This is uh, the first session in Godly Judgment. Um, and we're going to move into some verses here. We're actually going to be looking at verses 8 through 10 in Romans 13. And those set of ver that set of verses actually serves a dual role. The first thing verses 8, 9, and 10 do the, 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 is provide a post-doctrinal exhortation that kind of wraps up the things that we have already covered up to this point. And then they also serve as a pre-doctrinal exhortation for what we're about to encounter. I don't know if you've thought about it, but as we look at this introduction, and that's really what I've come to understand as we explained a few months ago, that Romans is the outline or the introduction to these things. We're not getting all the details that we're going to have uh, in Romans, but as we get ready to do this, we're halfway through the introduction to these sonship skills. We've done wisdom, and we've done justice, now we're about to do judgment, and if you look at the verses, what you'll find is that this is the shortest section out of all of the sections. Wisdom and justice are longer, equity is much longer. The section on judgment is the shortest of any of the sections. So now we're started on these last two sections. And really, you ought to be rejoicing at this point because not only are you halfway through the introduction to these decision-making skills and some things really have been accomplished in you but you're now entering the section of, the, of your education that um, let me see if I can phrase this right you're really entering the section of your education that moves you in, nah. I was going to say that moves you into a different area. It's, it's the, it's, I've got all this terminology and none of it's exactly right. W wisdom and justice are those things that are spelled out to you very plainly. When you get into judgment and equity, there's, there, you're not going to be given, you know, a bunch of things, a bunch of guidelines to go by you're going to have to begin to determine things for yourself. Ah, ah, I could say it like this. Now that you're getting ready to get into judgment, you are getting into the area where you are going to become a real threat to Satan and what he wants to do. Because now you're about to turn the corner to become, not that you weren't an adult before, you were. And you still have a lot to learn. And if I can bring something back to your remembrance, remember one of the dangers that I told you about all the way back to sonship orientation was when you get through these skills of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, and you get that under your belt, there is this idea because you will have made enough progress that you'll be able to look back and go, Hey, you know what? We really have gone somewhere. The danger is to think, I don't really need anything else. This is, this is enough. And it really isn't enough. And remember I was saying that. Even though what you know is way beyond what you knew before, you know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to, to be satisfied. So, uh, but, but you do know something. And now we're turning into this area where we really are going to become a threat to the adversary. Now, as I said to you a while ago, these, these, th these verses of 8, 9, and 10 do have within them a post-doctrinal exhortation. And it's going to be interesting to see what we have here. So, because they're summing up everything that has gone before... Let me show you something. Because, and this is for, not for no reason, and it's not for the purpose of review. This 
is for the purpose of getting all of this straight. I bet that's coming out light on the camera. Let me try a different marker and see if this doesn't do better. That's not much better, is it? Uh, there's the sections that we've divided this up into so far. Wow, every time I turn back around, someone else is here, okay. Well, I'm just going to keep turning around then. There, there's something I left out as we went through this. There's a couple of things I left out. I need to fill them in. That's one of the reasons that we're doing this, because what is about to happen in verses 8, 9, and 10 is all of this is going to be taken now and it's going to be summed up into a post-doctrinal exhortation. And I want this to be fresh in our thinking. And so, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, because what we were calling these is, these were the attributes of... These were the attributes of love. In other words... They were the things that we value and esteem because our Father does. And we value and esteem them for the same reason He does. So when you look at this, I didn't give you a word for Romans 12, 1 and 2. I actually started you in Romans 12, 3 through 8. And I gave you an attribute and it was selflessness. Do you remember that? And, we t and, and that was an attribute of godly love, that it is selfless. But you know what? I should have started you in verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2 is a checkpoint. That's true. But actually, 1 and 2 are asking you to do something. Now, I don't have this verse, I don't think, on the... I don't, I don't have this verse in the PowerPoint. So will you open up your Bible to Romans chapter 12? I want you to look at these first two verses. Now look, today is very, 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 very important because we're entering the area where you're actually now going to take all these things you've gotten so far and you're going to learn to utilize it to make sonship decisions every day. And I'm going to walk you through that process and because we're really getting to an area where we're going to become a threat to Satan, I'm going to need your participation today so that I'm sure we have an understanding of what we're doing. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is what verses 1 and 2 are giving us an attribute of godly love. What but really what are verses 1 and 2 just don't try to think about an attribute of love. What are they asking you to to do? What are those two verses asking you to do? They're asking you to serve. That is true. Anybody else have an idea? Now, now let's think about it in the aspect of godly love. Uh, Linda, you love Eric? Okay, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot here. It's just going out to 43 foreign countries, okay? You love Eric? Eric loves you. When you decided you loved each other, what, did you, what, what was the next step in your thinking? And, and marriage is what? Ooh, mar okay, Eric blurted it out, didn't he? Yeah. It, and commitment's a good word. You could have used a different word that would have got you in trouble. Yeah. Commitment. In other words, you are, when, you, when you love someone, you are committed, right? Do you remember what this first... Remember, let me back up this way. Because this first relationship was to God and His business. In other words, remember we talked about these were the different relationships. Here, remember in Romans 3, it was the relationship to ourself. 
Here, it was the relationship to the other saints. Here, it was the relationship to our enemies. Here, it was our relationship to government. Remember, we went through all of those? All right, as you go through this, this first one really is about making a commitment to your heavenly Father, which is in turn, it's not just a commitment to Him, it's a commitment to His business getting done, right? And what are you asked to do in that commitment? What are verses 1 and 2 asking us to do? I mean, they're right there in those verses. What, what does our commitment consist of? Huh? Alright. To first, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. You know some things are going to happen with this physical body. What's the second part of this commitment? Okay, not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed. And how are we going to be transformed? The renewing of our mind. And that's what the education does. So before you can go through the education, don't you have to make... You have to make... A commitment, right? And if you don't make that commitment, then the rest of it really is just data. I mean, it doesn't really do anything for you. Because if you're not committed, and that's why, and by the way, don't we say that? Don't we say that love is commitment? Of course we do. In fact, I think it is that first and foremost. Because until there is commitment behind it, do you really have much of anything else? So, here's, so as I look at these attributes of love, I think maybe I should, you know, if we were, if, I'm saying that the first thing is our love for our Father and His business means that we are committed. Now, this is going somewhere. I'm not, I, didn't, I never gave you that word commitment, but I'm giving it to you now because as we get into these verses now, we're going to be called upon to see all of this as part of a package. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. A man ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God dealt to every man the measure of faith. That was the selflessness that we, that we felt. Then, in Romans chapter 12, verse 9 to 16, when it came to the saints, we had another attribute. I did give you that. Does anybody remember what that was? Loving kindness. Remember that? We had that kind. We talked about what it meant to be kind. He talked about brotherly love. The word kind has the word kin in it. It was the love that you have for people who are members of your flesh and blood family. But this is not talking about flesh and blood. Now it's talking about loving the other saints with this kind of love, this kind of depth of commitment. So it was the loving kindness. And then we came to our enemies. And I didn't give you a word there. And I should have because we were coming down through there. And for some reason, I didn't do it. But I'm going to give you two words. They both fit, and they both mean the same thing. In fact, as I'm coming down through this, let me see if I can... I'm going to put the first one up, because, by the way, with your enemies, does anybody recall what is it that you are, you are asked to do about your enemies? Okay, to, if they have a need, to meet that need. What else are we called to do about our enemies? There's something we're called not to do. In other words, not just something we do, it's something we don't do. We don't, we don't avenge, avenge ourselves, right? And if you don't avenge yourself, now look, I know it'd be real easy to just look at the notes, but look, if you don't avenge yourself, aren't you being long-suffering? And isn't that exactly what our Father is doing in this dispensation of grace? He's being long-suffering. That's the whole reason we were able to come to Christ and to do the things that we did because God was being long-suffering with us. But I'm going to give you another word, and I almost didn't use this word. Um, not because it isn't right, but the word isn't in the text. 
But a lot of these words are not in the text. In other words, the word selflessness is not in the text. But that is what's being described when it says that a man ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. It is talking about selflessness. So we're just, we're not, I'm not necessarily, now loving kindness, we did pull words out of the text on that. Long suffering, if you are not, if you're going to wait and let the Lord say, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, then you know what that means? It, you, there is something that is supposed to be of greater value to you than seeing your enemy be punished for what they did. And what would that more important thing be? Seeing them come to Christ. Because remember, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Remember, we talked about all of that issue back there. But this other term is the term meekness. Now, what I want to do is, is I want to give you this definition. This, by the way, and I should have been doing this on the PowerPoint, so here we are. This is much more complete. But when we come to long-suffering and meekness, look what Charles Smith says about meekness. By the way, it looks like he's going to differentiate between meekness and some other terms that are similar. He says, meekness differs from mildness, gentleness, and softness in being never applied like them to deportment. Your deportment is your behavior. In other words, those terms of mildness, gentleness, and softness are used to describe someone's deportment or behavior, their conduct. He says, but meekness doesn't describe that, but only to the temper or character. And then look what he says, it is a theological virtue. But with the world at large, it is not in favor. The world doesn't like it. When has been imposed upon it the idea of excessive submissiveness. He said the world doesn't like the idea of meekness because the world has brought that term to mean excessively submissive. If you're meek, you're just, oh, you know what, you don't have any backbone, you're, all, you're cowardly, that kind of business. That's a wrong definition for meekness, but that's the way you think of it now, isn't it? If someone says, oh, well, they're, they're just meek. But now we're going to talk about the true meaning of meekness. And here it goes, still Charles Smith. Meekness results from the absence of arrogant self-will or self-assertion. It is the quality, look what he says, this is great. It is the quality which meets not violence with violence, or force with force, or clamor with clamor, but endures provocation and submits to wrong. Did that ring a bell with you when it says, it's the quality which meets not violence with violence? Did that ring a bell with you? It's in this passage. Rendered to no man what? I'm sorry, recompense to no man evil for evil. You know what that is? That's the definition of meekness. It means subjecting yourself to the wrong by, contro by controlling. your. Yes, you, you could respond, but meekness says... For something that's more important, I'm going to not respond. And so, and by the way, I want to back up and look at the end of that definition. But it endures provocation. Endures provocation. You ever had something that just, you know, it would be the, the old equivalent to the finger in the chest thing. You just... You just can take it so long, you know. Well, you know what? Meekness doesn't mean you're afraid. And it doesn't mean you're cowardly. Meekness means you have chosen to endure the wrong that has been done to you. By, and not to exchange violence with violence. Or evil for evil. You're choosing to do this. And we're not choosing it from the world's point of view. We're choosing it from our Father's point of view because we want something to be done in the life of our offender. 
That's what we're doing it for. And that's, that's the important difference to make. And so what we do is, we value and esteem what our Father wants to do in the life of our enemy more than we want to see them be punished for what they have done. Everybody with me on that so far? Okay. That brings us now to the next one in Romans 13, 1 through 7. And when we were there, I didn't give you a word for that either. And I have to tell you, this gave me some consternation. Because as I search for a word to do this, and I really think this is the right word, but this is a word, look, I'm just going to be honest with you. Nobody else in Sonship Circles is going to agree with me on this. I'm just going to tell you now. That's okay. Because I'm looking at every one of these attributes of love as what we are supposed to have for each of these areas of relationship. In other words, this is how we feel about God and His business. This is how we feel about ourselves. This is how we feel about the saints. This is how we feel about our enemies. And now this is going to be how we feel about government. This is not about how government feels about us. Are you with me there? Because that's the attribute that's been used here. I'm not going to use that one because that turns it around. This is not because the attribute that's normally used here is benevolent goodness. Because that's what government is supposed to bestow upon its citizens, benevolent goodness. But this is not talking about how government feels about us. This is talking about how we are supposed to feel toward government. And I've chosen a word that you can probably replace with a better word. There's probably people that are going to watch the DVD, they're going to understand what's being said, and they're going to say, hey, I understood why you used that word, but there's a much better word. So there may come a day when I hear what that word is that I go, you know what, that is a much better word, and I'll start using it. But until then, this is the word I'm using, and I'm going to show you. And the word is propriety. Propriety is a word that means proper conduct. Now, I'm going to give you this definition, by the way, because in the Oxford English Dictionary, now there's the propriety. Propri now, this is my definition. I'm putting it very simply in a nutshell. Then I'm going to give you the OED. Property is conduct befitting the situation or circumstance. If you're going to a wedding, if you're going to a wedding, what do you do? What, you dress up. Why? Why? Well, because there's a proper conduct that befits the occasion, right? If you're going to the beach, you don't put on a tux. We're going swimming, everybody get their formal stuff on. Come on. Propriety means that the, the thing you're doing befits the situation or the circumstance properly. There are certain things that you do. There are certain I, when I was, we, we've kind of lost that a little bit in this country these days. But when I was growing up, let me tell you what my parents... If it, let, let's suppose my folks were sick. And we did, one of those few times when we didn't go to church when I was growing up, we always went to church. We never didn't go to church. But on those few occasions when we didn't go, well, I guess I can't say we never did because there was a couple occasions when we didn't. But when we, on those couple of occasions, well, I, you know what? I wasn't sick. You know what I wanted to do? Go out in the backyard and play. But where I grew up, we were the last house on the block right beside a church. We were right beside a church. And the church parking lot, they actually pulled in, you know, you know what a hurricane fence is, chain link fence. They actually pulled in right along our facing our chain link fence as it went down the backyard, and then and they pulled up facing our front yard, but there was no fence in the front yard. So they just pulled up close to that and they parked there and they parked there and the church building was there. My mom would say. You can't go out and play. I go, but we're not, but I'm not sick. She goes, yeah, but people are in church. Now, I thought, why? But you know why. 
Because if I'm out in the yard playing, when those folks come out of church, they look at us like we're heathens, right? Well, those people, you know, so mom was not going to do that. Now, I'm not saying that's a, 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 probably a better idea of propriety is when my kids were little, I can remember wanting to teach my kids about proper things. So I taught them to say yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. It was remarkable the number of people that would hear my kids and would go, wow. I can remember preaching in the Bahamas one year. To, we had a missionary there and they had a church in the Bahamas. And I remember going to the Bahamas. And the kids went one year. The first year they didn't go. But the second time I went down there, I took the kids. Now, the, I had to pay for the kids to go. But we took the kids down there. And uh, they would say yes, sir, and no, ma'am to everybody. And I remember one of the ladies in the church saying, how nice that your children do that. Our, we, can't get, we can't get our kids to do that. I'm thinking, then you're not trying very hard. You know, I, 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 you know what? I insisted that they speak to people with respect. My grandbabies are grown now, and it's so much fun to watch them. I'm telling you, well... And when they answered the phone, I taught them to answer the phone this way. McDaniel residents, Tracy speaking. Identify who they are. I remember making a long distance call back to home when I was gone one time. And, uh, and, and Tracy answered the phone. And, 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 and before I hung up, the operator came back on. She said, I just want you to know you have the politest daughter. I just, I'm just amazed that you thought. And I thought, this should be the rule. This shouldn't be the, you know, the outstanding except, okay, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But my point is, I would teach my kids propriety. I even got the boys, and I told them, I said, here's how you offer your seat to a lady. And I would have them sit down on the sofa, and then I'd have my daughter walk in, and then I would teach them to stand up and say, take my seat, please. And then, you know, she would sit in their place. We rehearsed it, and we rehearsed it, and we rehearsed it. And I said, and when you go in, you pull out the chair for the lady, you know, and you do all of that. Yeah, you open the door, and you do all that stuff. So I'm teaching them this. I'm trying to teach. I said, this is called propriety. They couldn't even pronounce it. They were little. Okay. And so, you know, their mom was gone to a Bible study. When she cut back, this was going to be their big chance, you know, to show their propriety. And so... They're sitting on the sofa, and so in the door she comes, and so I told them, I said, okay, you know, here it comes, be ready, be ready. And they come in, when they come in, Mike Jr. stands up and he goes, take my seat, please. And I was like, oh, you know, she comes over and sits down and says, that is so nice. I think you boys deserve ice cream. Okay. They ran ahead, climbed up to the table. There was no more pulling out the chairs, opening the doors, propriety was over. <laughs> And you know, the, the, the lesson is immediately forgotten under the prospect of ice cream. But my point is that, you know what, the, you, those are the things I wanted in them because I wanted them to know how to conduct themselves properly, what to do. All right, well, okay, now I told that story, probably wasted time telling that story. But here's, here's the OED, so I'm saying propriety is conduct befitting the situation or circumstance. The Oxford English Dictionary says propriety is fitness, appropriateness, aptitude, suitability, appropriateness to the circumstances or conditions, conformity with requirement, rule, or principle, rightness, correctness, justness, isn't that the word to go in there, accuracy. Now, there's several places I could have highlighted, but because I had already talked to you about appropriateness to the conditions or circumstances, what I wanted to highlight here is conformity with the requirement, rule, or principle. And do you remember, whosoever resisteth the power resisteth what? The ordinance of God. And propriety is conformity, in this instance, with the ordinance of God. So it's just proper conduct. That's all that is. So I'm using this word because you know what I think? I think love has proper conduct. Now, 
I do realize that it is easy in certain relationships to take, you know, um, the way we act around people indicates how much we respect them and how much we care for them. Would you agree with that? Yes. And that is why um, there are people that go, well, I don't care who it is, you know, I just, it, brr, you know, I just, you know, you know, they, you know, they just, they're like that with everything. They have no respect for anything. There is no propriety. There is no conduct that's appropriate to the situation for them. Everything is demeaned and base. All right, for those people, tune out right here because I'm not talking to you. You need a different lesson. The, but the, the, but the, the, what, I'm, what I am getting at here is that, there are t that if, if there's someone that we care about, if there's someone... If there's something we value and esteem, then our conduct reflects that. That's why you don't give valuable things, things that maybe are fragile and have great sentimental value, and just use them as though they're everyday type things. I'll give you an example. I have on my shelf in my office at home my mother's Bible. It's the one she had back early on in her life. It's an odd type Bible. I don't really see them like that. It's about that thick. And it's just, it's kind of it's kind of like that. It's not big like my Bible is. And the print is pretty good size in there. And it has the uh, in thumb index all through it. And the pages, instead of being gold on the edges, they were red. And um, so just one of those older Bibles. And every once in a while, you'll see something she scribbled in the margin or somewhere on a blank page between the Testaments. And because it was hers and because it reveals a little bit of who she is, you know, that, that Bible is valuable to me. So you know what? If someone comes into the office and says, Hey, do you, do you, do you, got, you got a Bible I can use? I don't pull that one off the shelf and use it. It goes in a, bat, in a Ziploc where the air doesn't get to the page, because it's old now. I put it in a Ziploc, and I don't bring it out to use it, because it has that kind of value to me. There's other things that I may have that are of more value to me, so I make sure that I use them in the appropriate situation. I know all this seems very trivial and, 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 and logical and, and all of that, but that's the point that I'm making to try to defend my choice of the term propriety because I think a lot is wrapped up in that term. And I think that if you value and esteem government, then your conduct will properly befit the ordinance of God. That is my point here. Now, is there a better word? Probably. Well, you know what? That's a good way to say it. It's, a pri it's proper and it's a priority. And, and I think that that's a pretty good word. But you understand the reason I didn't go the other way is because this again is talking about how we feel about human government. Not how government... You know, I, see, I think it's inconsistent to say this is how we feel about ourselves, this is how we feel about the saints, this is how we feel about our enemies, this is how government feels about us. And so we're supposed to feel that way too. I think that's, you, you've now made it backwards from what it's supposed to be. This never was about how government feels toward us. This is about how we are supposed to respect the ordinance of God and have a response to human government because of the purpose God created it for. Okay, now that I've made that point and made everybody upset, let me move on now because uh, there, now I need to see these things again because when we talk about committed, by the way, I said to myself, if, the, if I'm right about these, I know where the meat comes on the bones. If this is the outline in Romans, when we get into 1 Corinthians and we see godly love being talked about over there, I should be able to define every one of these over there, right? So I started with the word committed or commitment, and I thought, you know what? There should be a commitment to this right off the bat. So you know what I find in verses 1 and 2? If I have not charity, 
I'm nothing. And doesn't it go all the way through that way? So I think that's the issue of commitment. So when we make a commitment to our Father, we're committing to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that means we will take on what He loves for the reasons He loves it. I, I think that's the commitment. I do. Here's the next one. Selflessness. I found it in verse 5. Charity seeketh not her own. That's selflessness, isn't it? So there it is. So, that, and that's how we think about ourselves. The next one, loving kindness. And that's exactly what it says in verse 4. Charity is kind. So there's that. And then, long-suffering or meekness. Well, here's what I found in verse 4. Charity suffereth long. Well, there's your long-suffering. And then, as far as meekness, look at verses 5 and 7. 5 says, is not easily provoked. And then verse 7 says, endureth all things. And those are the issues of meekness. And then, when we get it to propriety, proper conduct befitting the situation or circumstance, charity doth not behave itself unseemly. I find every one of those in Corinthians. By the way, I didn't have to change them. I, I, I only thought about going to Corinthians later, and it just turned out that, you know what? There they all were, sitting over there in Corinthians. So I felt pretty good about how that all worked out. And so, now, seeing all that, and I know the buzzer went off, I know that, but look, let me just read this first verse now, and we're going to start to tie this together when we come back from the break. There, here we are, Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything, wow, verse 9 is long. Owe no man anything but to love one another. I should have highlighted this in yellow, and I don't know why I didn't. Owe no man anything but to love one another. You know what he's doing? He's going to sum all of these attributes up, and he's going to say, this is what we owe people is to love them. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, Paul is not advocating that we go under the law. But remember, was there anything wrong with the law itself? No, the law was righteous. And he's going to say all of the things that are found in the law are actually wrapped up in this concept. Because look, verse 9, for this Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now we're going to have to come to this when we get into the details of this, we're going to have to we're going to have to define to you what a neighbor is. Because a neighbor is not just the person that lives next door. We think of that person as, an, as our neighbor. When the Bible uses this term, verse 10, love... See how we've stayed on this love issue here? Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. I knew someone that would look at that and say, your neighbor is the one that lives next door to you, so you can't do it to the guy that lives next door, but you can do it to the others. This is, this is not trying to limit who you have to be nice to, okay, or who you have to love. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Why would Paul even say this? Why would he even bring the law into it? Well, we are going to have to explain that so that you understand it completely. But you do understand that if someone comes along and says, you know what, the fact that you guys are not under a law, you can do whatever you want to do, and you think God is happy with that, Paul is going to tell you, no, you know what, we're not under a law, but because of what is being put in our inner man, we are fulfilling the law by these things. We're not lacking anything here. 
No one can look at that and go, well, if you guys were under the law, you know what? You'd be doing everything God wants you to do. This is exactly because you know what he just got through telling you? Everything in the law is wrapped up in that one saying. There it is. So we'll come back and, and we're not going to do that today, but we are going to look at why Paul takes us into the law. And so when we come back, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you the two divisions that we have for godly judgment. And then uh, we're going to do the very, very important work of understanding. Because don't you see how because he has gone to the issue of love, that he means for us to come back now and take all of these things we've gotten so far, and we're supposed to now start utilizing those in some godly decisions in our life every day. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you how that gets done. It's going to require your participation. And so whatever time we need to take with that, we will. But when you get through with this today, here's what you're going to be able to do. You're going to be able to take all those things that we just sat in here and studied and learned about and all of that, and you're going to take them out this door, and you're going to start using them in the decisions that you're making. And believe me when I tell you, we make a lot of decisions every day. Not all of them are earth shattering. Some of them we just make decisions about things and we don't even think about it being a decision. And some things we have decisions to make that we have to consider what is it that we're going to do. All of these things now are going to start to come into play in all of our decisions. Why do I want to do that with you? Because the more skillful you get at implementing these attributes into the decisions you're making, the more they're conforming you to the image of His Son, and the more skill you'll have to take with you to the heavenly places. So this is a critical thing. Okay, so we'll stop here, we'll come back and we'll do that after the break.